Yeah. All right, so what, uh, what does the confession, why does the confession of faith be, be, begin with a chapter on Holy Scripture? Scripture is the basis for the rest of the confession. So yeah, some, you should be saying something about this is foundational for everything else. Everything else we're going to study, uh, the, the, the final source of authority for all that we're going to say is going to be Scripture itself. Um, second question, it lists four properties of Scripture. Um, where, where, where I suggested you inspired thought. Where, where did I? I suggested it would be best to start with inspired, uh, not for any moral reason, but for a practical reason, that there's a certain things that flow from that. If this is from God, then it must be certain things, like or what? Authoritative. Yes, yeah, got to be authoritative. Infallible or inerrant, um, suffi sufficient, clear, necessary. So you should be able to get four of these, I would think. What's the other word for um, clarity? Perspicuity, yes. What do we mean by sola scriptura? Very important. Yes, and, as, and I would especially want to emphasize it's, it's not just that it's soul and that it's infallible, but it's the final. So there is the recognition that there are other sources that we go to, that we respect, that we honor, that we consult for the sake of understanding Scripture. So I, I, I don't read the Bible in ignorance of, for example, the creeds. No, the, uh, the ecumenical creeds, the, the Nicene Creed, uh, we recite the Apostles' Creed, the Athanasian Creed, uh, uh, the Chalcedonian Creed, uh, um, among others. So there, there's the creeds, there's the councils, um, you know, the Nicene, uh, Nicene, the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Ephesus, the Council of Chalcedon, um, again, among others that we honor, that we respect, that we consult, that we want to know uh, what the great minds of that era, when they got together, how they formulated, how they understood uh, the biblical teaching is to, to, to be expressed, uh, and how we are to speak of those things. And uh, then also theologians. Uh, so we respect uh, the great theologians of the past, the, the, the Tertullians and Cyprian and um, Athanasius and uh, Augustine and Chrysostom and, and, and so forth. So as an example of this, I may or may not have cited uh, the fact that Calvin quotes uh, Augustine on every other page, more cited than any other person. Um, interestingly, um, I, I believe second is Bernard of Clairvaux. There, any, anyway, Bernard and Chrysostom are up there um, uh, together, very, very, very high on his list. But Bernard, he's a you know he's twelfth century monk, um, the one who called for uh, you know the first great crusade, um, and uh, the one who but we believe wrote the hymns of Jesus. The very thought of thee is sweet and stills my breast. But you know there was a very deep piety in Bernard. Bernard was a Cistercian. The Cistercians were called the Puritans of the. Middle Ages, because of the austerity of the buildings they built, they did away with all of the decorations and, and, and had a very plain style, and hence their, you know, their uh, comparison with the Puritans. They did, didn't want distractions uh, in the place of worship, um, uh, drawing the attention of worshipers away from the worship of God himself. The whole counsel of God is to be found in Scripture and what Scripture explicitly states, and what by good and necessary consequence may be blank from Scripture. Deduce, right? Deduce. Again, very important concept. Uh, scripture teaches uh, directly, but it also teaches indirectly by what it implies, what, what, uh, what of necessity must be drawn out of it and deduced, and for which we will be accountable in the same way that Jesus held the Sadducees responsible for not knowing about the resurrection of the dead on the basis of God calling himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, yet there are areas of faith and life in which we are not guided directly by Scripture. What provides us with counsel in these cases? The light of nature. 
Yes, all right, that's one. Light of nature. Wisdom. Yep, Christian prudence is the... Any other? Analogy of faith. Um, yep, yeah, yeah, cer certainly I'm not sure that that's a directly applies here. How, how, how would you see it applying here? Well, it goes with purpose and If something is unclear in one place, we look at all of Scripture and say, how does, it, how does it seem to teach on this? So what is the, the, uh, the clear teaching of Scripture in other places? The rule of faith, the knowledge of faith? Yes, yes. And, and then in terms of number four, two, right deductions. Okay. Um, catechism questions. Together, what is the chief end of man? And chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. What rule hath God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him? The word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. What do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. Okay, very good. Any questions remaining from last week? Let's, uh, let's move on to God and the Holy Trinity. Question number one, the catechism's listing of the attributes is comprehensive yet unelaborated. For example, the meaning of immutability and impassibility without passions are unexplained. Holiness, justice, and goodness are undefined. Why is this? Why is the discussion of the attributes so abbreviated? Yes. Yes, that, that is the case. Um, so what, uh, what, what, we, what I draw, drew attention to in the notes was that Calvin's uh, treatment of the doctrine of God, meaning both attributes and, and the Trinity, is abbreviated in the, in the Institutes. And uh, so we find the same to be here true, too. This is a fairly short chapter compared to a number of the other chapters, and yet what's more fundamental, what's more basic than, um, the, than what we believe to be true about God himself? And the reason why it was abbreviated was because there was very little disagreement with the, with, the, with the traditional understanding as it was received at the time of the Reformation. So the, the, um, you know, the, 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 the early theologians of the church, the councils of the church, the creeds of the church, uh, the doctrine of God is understood throughout the Middle Ages, uh, Aquinas, and then into the, time, the period of the Reformation, there wasn't a lot of disagreement between what became the Roman, Catholics, uh, Roman Catholic position and the Protestant position on the doctrine of God. So the formulation of the Trinity, for example, it's the, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's the formulation of Nicaea. God of God, light of light, very God of the very God, begotten, not be made, being of one substance with the Father. That's, uh, that's uh, the language of Nicaea. Did the, did the Reformation receive that? Yes. Did it try to alter it? No. So, um, uh, and the same we'll see is true of the, of the dual nature of Christ, which is related to the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in what sense is Jesus the Son of God? Is he not just Son of God, but God the Son? And the answer um, of the the patristic church and the medieval church and the time of the Reformation, that's received. That's agreed upon. We're not arguing about that. We're going to argue about other things. We're going to argue about the church. We're going to argue about justification. So we're going to, we're going to argue about the sacraments. We're going to have some significant arguments, but we're not really arguing about the doctrine of God. So there's, there's, no, there's no impetus to elaborate and develop and defend um, the doctrines 
which itself is significant. When you go over the list of the doctrines, it's significant that, you know, that basically you know, there wasn't much disagreement. And you really don't get, you have to get into the 18th century and the Enlightenment before uh, essential doctrines begin to be challenged. I mean, there's heretical groups all through the centuries, but where there's significant challenge, that, that doesn't happen until really the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And so it, you're into the 18th century before there's, you know, the Socinians and then the, uh, the Unitarians and, and uh, you know, others begin to, ch to challenge all that. So another question uh, that I want to ask really that precedes this question is, okay, we understand why that we start with the Scripture when we, um, you know, study the basic doctrines of the Christian faith because that's foundational to everything else. Um, why is the doctrine of God next? And we only understand. First thing the scriptures even mentions. In the beginning, God. Yes, that's where the Bible directs us first. In the beginning, God. Uh, so I, I would, I would want to, you know, argue if we have a foundation. If, let's say we're building a, a pyramid. Then the the pyramid would look something like this. We've got scripture here. The next block would have to be God. And then as we go on up, you know, it's going to be man and sin. And then it's going to be, you know, salvation and, and on up. So at the bottom, the most fundamental things that we need to understand, we need to understand scripture and we need to understand the doctrine of God. So then I would argue in a practical sense, um, that if in virtually in any aspect of life, if you're not starting with God, you're going to get it wrong. Uh, and start with man, and you're going to end up with something very much like Arminianism. Okay. Yes. If you start, here's what I'm trying to say. Let's say you. Can you start from here and argue up and get right and get the truth about God right? So let's say you start here with your circumstances. Um, let's say your circumstances are wonderful. And you, can you, from that, everything's going well, everything is fabulous, uh, life is wonderful. Can you argue from that to, to what must be true about God? Or the other way around. Everything is terrible, um, life is tough, um, I've, I've suffered all these tragedies. Can we argue from? From that, back up to what must be true about God. Take the latter of those two cases. If I'm trying to figure out the truth about God and I'm looking at life right now and life is terrible and I've been through tragic circumstances, what, what uh, would be logical for me to conclude about God? He is not loving. Yeah. All right, yes. Or you can't control things that affect me. I mean, Romans 1 tells us that we can't learn true things about God from our experience, from nature. In nature, in our Well, you can't our see. circumstances are part of nature. Uh, but not complete things. We can learn true things about God from experience, but we'll be missing an awful lot. Um, yes, and with a fallen mind, I'm going to get it wrong. I mean, that's the point of Romans 1. I should know better, but I don't. And uh, the problem is that, you know, the, the mind is not, like, um, is not free from, what's, what is the phrase, the noetic effects of sin. It's not, it's not, been, it's not as though that the, the, the brain, the mind, reason is able to operate autonomously up here um, and to sort through facts and evidence in a way that's detached from the fallenness of my nature. My emotions are fallen. My reason is fallen. Everything about me is fallen. There's no faculty that remains untouched and unspoiled by sin. So if I start down here and I'm looking at circumstances and everything is terrible, I'm liable to conclude, one, is that God doesn't care. All right? He isn't loving. He doesn't, he doesn't care. He's, or, or that he's, um, he's a disinterested. Or some, unable, yeah. Capricious. He doesn't have the power. Um, or, or, yeah, I can't spell capricious, but yes, that he's, uh, he's, um, what's another way to say that? So, so that I can spell it correctly. 
<laughs> what I mean, what I'm maybe I'm misinterpret, uh, maybe I'm mis, like I'm not defining capricious right, but maybe he like he delights in evil. Maybe God is just evil, so he really likes to torture us. Or if you're uh, if you're you might produce these jokes. Get what you deserve. Right, right. It, you might just think, yes, this is just punishment. I'm so bad that he's, I'm, getting, I'm getting whipped for all of this. So that there's all this fear here of, of, of con wrong conclusions that if I start down here, and let's, um, let's say I'm trying to be an obedient Christian, and I'm trying to be faithful, and I'm trying to worship him, and I'm, I'm to, um, trying to serve him, and, and everything has gone wrong, um, I would be very, very tempted then and, and this is why, isn't this why people get angry with God? Isn't this why um, they um, fall from the faith? Um, they abandon uh, the Christian faith? Because they, they look at the circumstances. They're looking down here, and they're trying to reason from what's going on down here up to there. And you're going to get it wrong if you, if, you, if, you, if you proceed on that basis. You're going to think, well, he doesn't care. He's disinterested. He's unable. I mean, that was um, that was the... Rabbi Kushner and why bad things happen to good people. That was his conclusion. He thought, and people sung the praises for that book. This came out in the 1980s. And his conclusion was God, God cares and he loves and all that. He just can't do anything about it. And people were comforted by that. I was horrified. God can't do anything about it. What, what's coming next that has no reason, no purpose? It's just that God couldn't stop it from happening. Um, so... We start with God because if we don't start with God and we try to start with man and we try to start just thinking generally about life and, gen uh, you know, broadly speaking, if I start down here, I can't get back up to God. I have to start from God and then reason down to my circumstances. So if everything is going right, does that mean not because I'm a wonderful person or that, is it because God is gracious? If everything is going wrong, um, is that because God doesn't care or do, do, I, do I filter that through the lens of, of the wisdom, power, and goodness of God? Um, so if I've, if I've gone through a series of tragedies, I'm in a Job-like condition, and I'm, but I'm convinced that God is wise and God is, is, is good and God is all-powerful, then I'm in a position to draw the right conclusions, that he, he's working out his purposes. Um, uh, he, he's... he's he, he could have prevented this and didn't. And he is good, and he has my well-being in mind. He has my welfare in mind. Um, and his wisdom, that this was the right means to the end of that good thing in my life. So I, I can trust him with, my, with those circumstances. So if I start with God, then I'm in a position to, to draw the right conclusions about circumstances. If I start with the circumstances... I'm, I'm highly unlikely to get back to God with anything close to the truth. You see what, you see what I'm saying? You can't start down here. This is why God, the, doc, the chapter on God follows the chapter on Scripture. I've got to get this fundamental thing right. Now I can go on and look at these other things. And I, I like the, uh, as broad categories, wisdom, goodness, and uh, um, power. I mean, really, the prayer that you may have learned as a child, and the first prayer I learned was, God is great and God is good. There's the whole mystery of the world right there. Is God great and good? Can you affirm that? Uh, to affirm that, you know, that, uh, that means God is, um, you know, he, he is, he's great, he's all-powerful, and, and yet he's good. And yet, uh, and yet there's evil in the world. Yet there's these tragedies that take place um, that are so unsettling. Um, and so uh, to affirm that God is great and God is good is uh, one of the great uh, affirmations of faith. All right, so we start with God because if we don't start with God, we're going to get everything else wrong. We will start drawing a whole series of wrong conclusions. Uh, okay, second, according to the notes, what is the difference between the incommunicable and communicable attributes? How is this distinction helpful where do we find this distinction in the standards? Incommunicable has to do with God only. Communicable has to do 
communicable and those in which men may share in some sense. Distinction is helpful showing the difference or the distinction between creator and creature. God is completely other than us. He's infinite and comprehensible. We can't know all there is to know of him without finite means. But we're still committed to him. But it helps us understand where we can be like that. Right. Yeah. But these are ways in which we are to be like that. We are not commanded to be infinite. So, so incommunicable, that is true of God alone. Uh, we are not infinite or eternal or unchanging. Right? Immutability, that's only God. Um, infinite, that's only God. We're finite. Um, eternal, um, we're, we're temporal. That's, uh, that's only God. So those are the things that are true of God. Um, good, can we be good? Uh, yeah, you know, approximately. Uh, can we be holy? Can we be gracious? Can we be kind? Can we be patient? Those are all divine attributes. It's a, we are capable of sharing in those, participating in that. Um, um, uh, we, we, there's nothing we can do about being infinite, not being infinite, but we can be loving uh, and so on. So that, that's the basic distinction. Um, and um, uh, how's this distinction helpful? Um, what uh, Frankie just said, I, I think it, it's helpful in, in maintaining the creature-creator distinction. We are not God. God is God, and he's, he is, you know, Karl Barth's language, I don't endorse Barth's theology, was God is wholly other. You know, he is not a bigger front, a version of ourselves. Another thing that Barth says, you can't find God by shouting man in a loud voice. You know, the, this is the problem with the Greek gods. They're just bigger versions of ourselves. Every bit as corrupt as we are. They just have more power, more knowledge. Uh, they're just extended versions of ourselves. That's right. Things really in our own minds. They're just they're just um, products of what's on, what's on, in our in our heads. Right. So so we have to, you know, in terms of um, in terms of all that we know, we have to put God on one side of the line, and then everything else goes over here. You know, uh, man, animals, um, you know, planets, e everything else is finite. Only God is infinite. Only God is eternal. Only God is immutable. Only God is independent. We are dependent. He is not. So um, this, uh, this, this distinction between the communicable and the, and the incommunicable, it does help us to maintain this distinction between the creature and the creator. I think it's important because I think in popular piety these days, I think that, that I think your average Christian, even your average sincere Christian, is carrying around the notion that God is just a bigger version of ourselves. He's just like us. He's just got more power. He's just like us. He's just got more knowledge. He's not like the Greek gods because he doesn't have those flaws. He's perfect. But in so many other ways, we see him as an, ex you know, an extension of ourselves, whereas what he says through Isaiah, Isaiah 55, is my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Get that out of your heads. Um, God, at the end of Romans 11, God's ways are inscrutable. They're past finding out. Who's known his ways? Who can understand him? Uh, Isaiah, again, you surely you are a God who hides himself. There's this whole aspect of his unknowability, the hiddenness of God. Um, and I, th you know, I, th um, I think that that's, a, that's something that's get, been lost, I think, in, in recent years uh, that needs to be recovered. Right, this high view of God, God as other, God as distinct from us. Um, we'll look at you know, how we're made in his image when we get to the chapter on man. Um, but th though we're made in his image, we shouldn't confuse that with um, the divine, divine attributes, which we don't share in, in any respect at all. Uh, so, what's interesting is that the incommunicable attributes also highlight our insufficiency in being able to describe God. So we have to do it, so, right, we are finite, all we can say is in the negative, he's infinite. Right, so it shows us incomprehensibility because we have, we can't, we know it's finiteness, but we don't really know, so we just say he's not finite, he's not incomprehensible, he's not. Yeah, and what Dr. Packer used to say to us was, 
that, you know, if the truth of God is here, the closest we can get is to draw a circle about like that and say the truth lies in this circle somewhere. But he, he is beyond our ability to, to um, you know, Calvin says God lists at us. He, he speaks baby talk to us. Because that's all we're able to handle is baby talk. So he has to talk down to us, down to our level. We don't know him as he is. This trips people up so we do. I've seen this recently. I've seen it out there. How about when it comes to Jesus? And he said, God is not a man like us. He's only other. So Jesus can't be God because he's a man. Well, then that's a confusion of the uh, divine and human nature of Christ. Um, so that's, that's, you know, again, where the orthodox affirmations, they, uh, they say they are un union, the human and the divine are united in Christ, but they're not confused. And so um, should we argue that God has a body because Jesus had a body? No, that, that was, a, it was a part of his human nature. God does not have a body. How do we know? Jesus says God is spirit. So God doesn't have a body. God is invisible. So in the, in the union of the human and the divine, when we look at the body of Jesus, or think of the body of Jesus, we're thinking of Jesus in his humanity, not in his divinity. So they're united, but they're not confused. Matthew, did you? It, it occurs to me, I've never thought of this, um, there are certain things that we are commanded to be or to strive to, through the Holy Spirit or to exhibit. Those would be communicable attributes. We're never told to be omniscient. We're never told to be infinite. But we are told to be holy. We are told to be loving. And righteous and just. Yeah, and so that which he commands, he communicates to us as well. As other people say. Yeah, and that, that, that communicable word um, is a Latin, from the Latin word. It means to share. We share in these in, to, in some degree. We're capable of sharing in them. Of those, of those things characterizing us. We can be holy. We can be good. Goodness can be characteristic of us. Um, all right. Uh, yes. Would you say that much of broadly based evangelicalism has a deficient understanding of God as represented by the informality in which they treat him in worship? Well, I would say that. Um, um, no, I mean, I, I would say in terms of um, personal testimony, I guess that's really what you're talking about. It'd be hard to generalize, but I, in terms of personal tes testimony, the a Copernican revolution took place in my life when I read Knowing God. And I became reformed or Calvinistic in my theology, and I came to understand the sovereignty of God and uh, got more deeply into the mysteries of human responsibility and divine sovereignty and the nature of the Trinity and these things that were beyond comprehension. And when I began to see the greatness of God, it changed the way I wanted to worship. If you can believe it or not, I was sitting around in circles singing choruses in college. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. Soon all those around will warm up to its glow. That's how it is with God's love. Yeah. I got to the point where we were singing, that's how it is with puppy love. Um, so, yeah. So that there, there began a process for me. Um, and I've actually written about this in the second chapter of uh, When Grace Comes Home. Uh, a, a vision of the greatness of God changed the way I wanted to worship. I wanted words that were sufficient to his, to his majesty. You know, I wanted, I wanted language, um, the language that was being supplied by the great hymns. I wanted, um, you know, it, it was uh, the, prayer, the prayer book, uh, communion, confession of sin. And I sometimes get the, da the daily one and the communion one mixed up, but... It, it just took me to a depth to which I had never been. Um, I hated the prayer book my first six months in England. Um, I just hated it. And, and I hated it so much that I went to Scotland for my internship because I couldn't bear to be with the Church of England congregation and use the prayer book you know, for another, another month of 
But, but the prayer book confession of sin got to me. You know, thoughts, words, deeds, evil done, good left under and undone, whether, uh, whether uh, ignorance or weakness, our own deliberate faults, um, uh, provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us. Um, th that language was so much deeper than anything that had ever entered my mind about the seriousness of sin. And so, you know, paralleling that, then you take sin seriously. Well, you do that because you take God seriously. It's the holiness of God that makes sin such a terrible thing. And, and, and then I, I wanted the language, wanted to hear that language in the hymns that we were singing and in the prayers that were being offered and in the demeanor of the, of the preacher that he was handling, holy things. So I was looking for reverence. You see the way these things are interrelated? I, I needed reverence in worship. I, I, I couldn't stand anymore for the gregarious song leader up there, first and last stands and cracking jokes, you know, between. I, I couldn't put up with that anymore. And I couldn't put up with syrupy uh, little choruses either. And I didn't want entertainers, a praise band up there entertaining us. So, who asked that question? <laughs> Thanks for that softball, Warren. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I, I don't see how it doesn't have an impact. I, I don't see if you really take the, the orthodox doctrine of God seriously, I don't see how you can settle for, I'm biasing it by calling it superficial worship, shallow worship. Um, I, I think you'll long for something deeper, more substantial, uh, in terms of the prayers and the songs and the preaching and how the sacraments are administered and all of that. You'll want some reverence. You'll want some depth. That's what your soul is longing for. Uh, so that was certainly the case for me. And I know it's been the case for, for some of you others as well. Because, you know, I cut my teeth on a revivalistic Baptist background. And, I, and it was great preaching. It was gospel preaching. It, and it was great preaching. This is a little Baptist church in our community. And the, the preacher, Martin Van Buren Canavan the fourth, whatever. And he, he was a great evangelistic preacher, and I'm thankful for it. But the worship was nothing. I mean, it was zero. It was, you know, it was first and last of a couple of hymns, take up the offering, the choir sings, the preacher preaches, and then 25 stanzas of Just As I Am till somebody comes forward. By the way, we're going to sing Just As I Am at the conclusion Sunday morning this Sunday. But the word, I just looked it back over it again. The words are great. They really are. Everybody yeah, better come forward. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. Was that not part of your listening? <laughs> listening? Praise to God. This I mean, growing up in that. You know, is that my as listening? Weak as it is. You know, as weak as it is when you look back. You know. Yeah, I mean... Calvin said, God lisped us, not that we're to lisp back to him. <laughs> but, but I guess you could say that we do, uh, regardless. Uh, okay, third question. Among the incommunicable attributes, God's eternality, immutability, independence, and impassibility are said to be interrelated and interdependent. Compromise one and all are compromised. Why is this? Well, if he's not eternal, then that means something could change him and make him go away, and he's no longer independent. So, like, whenever you take one of them away, the rest of them, if you just think through it logically, are no longer relevant or necessarily true. Yes. Yeah, so, so. Actions will constitute the change. Yes. It, it, yes. Uh, where, wherever you want to start, start with uh, as Ben did with e eternality. If God is e eternal. Um, then he, 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 he must be unchanging. If he's not un unchanging, he's not eternal. If he's impassable, if his emotions are changing, again, then he's not immutable. And if he's, and he's not immutable, he's not eternal. If he's eternal, then he must be impassable and he must be immutable. <laughs> that help? <laughs> now, if you take away uh, any of these individual attributes, you're basically confining or limiting him and, and all the others. You're, you're, you're 
you're taking an essential part out of the whole. And so there's been a, been, been a huge discussion about impassibility among reform people in the last decade or so. Um, as far as I'm able to, to discern, you have, uh, th this is the controversial, the most, I think, I think I'd say the most controversial uh, aspect of the, of the attributes. There is but one only living and true God who is infinite in being and perfection, a most holy, pure, invisible, a most pure spirit, rather, invisible, without body, heart, or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will for his own glory. Uh, so in, there's been this debate over in, in, um, passions, impassibility, body parts or passions. Um, I think the easiest way to enter that discussion is to ask the question, is God, because of sin, always upset? Or is God blessed? And is God eternally happy? And is heaven a happy place? If God is... If we're to understand the anger of God the way that we understand anger as it applies to man, um, and if God is angry with sin in the way that human beings are angry with each other, and sin is always going on, then God must be always miserable. Is that true? No, that can't be true. Is God the most happy of all beings? Is our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this eternally loving uh, and... and, and um, comforting and blessed relationship, each delighting in the other from all eternity into all eternity. Is that, is that not the case? Uh, yes. Uh, so th that means we have to understand the, what the, the language as applied to the emotions differently. Whatever is meant by them, they're not meant the way that they apply to us. In the same way, does God have a hand? How do we know God's invisible? He's a spirit. So when we see, you know, the Bible speaks of God having hands and arms and legs and eyes and ears and all of those. Um, how, how, are, how are we to understand all of those things? Uh, well, the theologians say it's anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic language uh, uh, in the form that's man, for, in the form of man. We're speaking about God in the form of man, as though he were a man. So that when we're speaking, for example, of the wrath of God, we're talking about God is responding to our sin as we would were we angry. He disapproves of it and he punishes it. Is he made miserable by it the way we're made miserable? Our, our, you know, we even have a physiological response when we're angry, don't we? I mean, the blood, the blood pressure, blood rushes into our head. We... Um, we have these physiological reactions uh, when we become angry. Is that true of God? Does God have, no, God doesn't have a body. So there's no physiological co co component to his anger or to his wrath. Um, so what, what does it mean? Well, what's it mean when we say that he has an eye? It means that he sees everything and he knows everything. Does he have a literal eye? No. What does it mean when he says he's angry? It means that he, that he responds like we do. Like, like, like the way he sees, the way that we do when we have an eye. But when we, when we say he's angry, we're saying about him that he is responding the way that we do, when we are angry. So he's going to punish. He's going to punish. He disapproves and he punishes that, uh, that particular thing. Yes? So we, we know we're created in his image. We know that in that context, that anthropomorphic context, that image being him it, with those eyes, those ears, and everything else in spirit. But, but, but we still don't recreate it in his image in that, in, that, in that context. Yes, but are our bodies part of that image? We'd have to be very careful there, wouldn't we? Because God is spirit. But you could say that we have, we have hands, we have eyes and everything to sort of get an understanding of what, what that says about God. Like, how he, like we are the, the other end of the analogy of like, 
there's a truer sense of seeing that we can understand through our physical eyes. Almost like the purpose is that we finally see what God. Exactly. Psalm 92, he who has the eyes, can, he who made the eyes, can he not see? He who made the ear, can he not? That's that reasoning that you're talking about. If we have eyes, surely God has to be able to see. How can we have eyes and think that God can't see? How can we have ears and think that God can't hear? How can we think and not think that God can think? Yeah, so there, 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 it does, you know, there is a correspondence, but we're not to think of that in crude terms the way the ancient Greeks and ancient Romans did, or the way that the Mormons do. The Mormons say God is a body. Neil Stewart talked about impassibility and how it affects pre when preaching about God. Do you remember? I kind of remember what he was saying about the difficulties there, or what's proper to say and what's not proper to say about God in a sermon. You mean at, at you mean at Twin Lakes that time? Yeah. Um, yeah. He then got corrected. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, what, what was the point that he was trying to make? I can't. When he preaches, he talks about God being angry. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, so it's right. That's, that's Bible language. That's the language of the Bible. So it's right to use that language, but we shouldn't understand it, his anger in the way that we understand. All right, whatever, whatever we say about the whole range of human emotions, as those, that language is applied to God, it doesn't mean the same thing in God as it means in us. Because he's infinite and we're finite. Because he's unchanging and we're, we are always changing. Yes? Is, is there a, I guess, a signpost that would be more helpful than Acts 14, 15 for this? Because, or I'm not sure if it's 15, that's the verse, but it says, we, we also are men of like passions with you. Logically, it's just saying their, relation, their relationship with other people. Yes, that's nature. Well, I, and I think the inference, we as men have passions like you, God not being anything, does not have such passion. I think that's the inference. So, yeah, I, I think you're right. Because um, I, I, I do struggle with the passions when I'm, I'm wrestling with trying to figure that out. What the... Well, I mean, the, 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 um, the implication of that is... Uh, we are men of like passions, so we're not gods. In other words, we're not the deity. We can't be because we're, we have passions like you do. We're the same nature as you are. You want to put it that way. That would be the very point that we're making, right? So the, these skip scripture proofs are, are, are you know, are, are making some of the, several of the points that we are making. Um, you, so, you saw no manner of um, similitude. I mean, the modern translation, you saw no form. God spoke to you. You saw no form. We've been looking at this in the Ten Commandments. Why are you not to make any graven images? Because when God revealed himself to you, there was no form. You heard only a voice. Uh, he, children's catechism question number one. Uh, uh, God, God has not a body like men. Yeah, yes? But that said, Paul is speaking with people like the Jews that know the one true God. But he was talking to the Greeks there, and the Greeks have tons of gods, and their gods do have passions. Zeus right. and all the, all the rest of them. So, also out of the TP moments. So yeah. at that point, if he's saying we're not gods because we have passions, when the Greek gods have passions, so that would mean that they could still be gods. Yeah. No, he's correcting them. This is how you know we're not gods, and why your gods are not gods. Um, so... I, I think it does also, I mean, if, if you're asking for a signpost for it, I think it also does have to relate to being immutable. Because the, the passions would be to change that God does not change that explicit. If, yeah, I, I agree. If that's, if that's what that means. Because what, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I consider when I see uh, God's not passions, I think of when it talks about how Christ has compassion on the, on the people that he sees. So... Maybe we'll get into it more when we talk about the dual nature of Christ. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but that's, that's what my mind goes Yeah, and I want to say, I think the most difficult of all the attributes to try to get a handle on is impassibility. So I really should move on before I say something I don't know. 
I'm not saying that God doesn't have emotions. I think that's what people, correct me if I'm wrong. When we talk about passions, we're not talking about emotions. Right? So God, if God is angry at sin. But and when it talks about being roused to anger, it's not that we have any control over God. That we have caused God to be overwhelmed by anger. Passion, uh, as I've studied it, means like passion of the Christ, suffering. Right? God does not suffer. He's not overwhelmed. Yeah. So then when I do sin, and God is angry at my sin, I it's I who have changed. And I'm the one that's changing, and as I change, I'm looking now at a different facet of God. Now I see his anger. Because I've changed my position. Now I'm sin. Just don't, just don't read into that that God is upset. Right. That, no. that, that his blood pressure has gone up. Right. That he's no. turning red. That his heart is pounding more, more deeply. That he's being made miserable. Right. Um, right. God is not a victim of you ever. Right. Okay, let's, let's go on with this. Um, so he's working all things according to the counsel of his own uh, immutable and most righteous will for his own glory. Um, where's page 10? Oh, it's on the other side. Um, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. That's straight out of Exodus 34 the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and withal most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. Also, straight out of Exodus 34. God hath all life, glory, goodness, blessedness. So, then we're back to that again. Blessedness. God is blessed. God is happy. Perpetually. Eternally. Unchange unchangingly. And in and of himself, and, and is alone in and unto himself, all sufficient, not standing in need of any creatures which he hath made, nor deriving any glory from them, uh, but only manifesting his own glory in, by, and unto, and upon them. So there, there is no, God is utter, utterly independent. We are absolutely dependent. He is absolutely not dependent. He is self-existent and perpetuates that existence has, and has no need of anything outside of himself. So the whole idea, for example, that God created because he was lonely. That, that was an evangelistic appeal, appeal that was you know, typically made when I was growing up. God is lonely. He, need, he wants friends. So, uh, and he's caught crying out to you. So the, the poor God kind of evangelistic appeals way off base. God does not need us at all. He, again, he is eternally happy in heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, mutually delighting in each other and not standing in any need of anything outside of themselves. So to create is something that is freely entered into, not uh, undertaken because there was some itch in the divine nature that needed to be scratched. Um, he is alone the fountain of all being, of whom, through whom, and to whom are all things, and hath most sovereign dominion over them, to do by them, for them, or upon them, whatsoever himself pleaseth. In his sight all things are open and manifest. His knowledge is infinite, infallible, and independent upon the creature, so as nothing to him is contingent or uncertain. He is most holy in all his counsels, in all his works, and all his commands. To him is due from angels and men and every other creature whatsoever worship, service, uh, or obedience he is pleased to require of them. There's no discernible order to this. Um, I mean, people much smarter than I have have gone through this, the first two um, uh, paragraphs and tried to figure out if there's some order. Is there some logical ordering of these attributes? I'm not able to discover it. Um, as far as I know, no one else has been able to discover it either. Ben? Is there a logical reason for the separation in paragraph one and two? I couldn't even figure, figure that out. I, I don't, I, again, I, I don't know. I don't know. So, so, you know, people have gone back through and tried to bring order to, um, to, to it themselves, and we'll look at that in a minute. Um, so here, a couple of examples in the way in which the attributes are, are revealed in scripture and then utilized. 
um, and become a part of the piety of God's people. Uh, here is, uh, here is that, uh, that, se that, that seminal revelation of God given to Moses when Moses says, show me your glory, and uh, God says, you can't see my glory and live, so I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock, and I'm going to let my backside, if you saw the front side, my face, as it were, it would obliterate you. And so he sees sort of the, the, the back side of his glory. And he reveals himself, proclaimed himself, the Lord merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. That's that Hebrew word hesed and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love, hesed again for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. But who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So when God reveals himself, he reveals himself in terms of these attributes. Here are the categories into which you are to understand me. This is what is true of me. Uh, another, another great passage that utilizes those attributes, this is David's prayer um, on, the, on the eve of the building of the temple where he, is, he has gathered up all the materials to be used and now he is dedicating them. Listen to this prayer, going back to the whole question about how does this affect your worship. David's prayer, yours, O Lord, is the, the greatness and, and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all. And in your hand are power and might. And in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. I mean, it's a magnificent prayer. Well, just full of God, isn't it? Um, so I think, I think you go into the average church. I don't think the prayers are full of God. I think they're full of us. Full of, you know, this world, our things, our needs, our wants, our desires. And there's a place for that for sure. But I think it's secondary. You, got to, you have to get God straight, and then the rest of the things begin to fall into place. Now here's just randomly almost a psalm. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord uh, with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Uh, great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them, full of splendor and majesty, and his righteousness endures forever. He caused his wondrous works to be remembered. Remembered, the Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hand are faithful and just, and his precepts are trustworthy. So again, and um, I, I don't remember, remember, I don't think I used this number with you uh, last week, but I've gone through and counted up Every mention of an attribute in the book of Psalms, either a direct uh, mention of that, like, like with this, righteousness, graciousness, mercy, faithful, just, okay, count, count all those up. Then I went through and counted up all the metaphors for the attributes, like, you know, he's a stronghold and a fortress and a shield and a buttress and all of those. Any, any, any guess about how many? count all of all the attributes and all the metaphors of attributes. How many, how many mentions in 150 Psalms? 1,054. You're not far off. <laughs> I saw it was for all the screen. You must have written it out. Is it, is, I was going to say it was 844. Is it 854? Yeah, I, I, you're, I think you're right. I think it's 854. Another 5.6 attributes per Psalm by average. I mean, um, it's, uh, you know, you know I, I think it's, it's all the more, um, uh, all the more important to recognize that when we think about the Psalms, we usually think about the Psalms as being very um, subjective, um, you know, full of us expressing our fears, our anxieties, our needs, very subjective, very individualistic, and it's easy to overlook. And now that I hope you'll be looking for this when you read through the Psalms. It's easy to overlook the fact that the Psalms are just loaded with references to the attributes of God. And they are the basis then of the pleading that goes on. I mean, I don't know, 40% of the Psalms are laments. They're laments, but they're laments that, that have some hope of some resolution to the problem that's being faced. 
on the basis of the attributes that are being appealed to.